Welcome to the Scottish Paranormal Podcast. I'm your host Chris and here we're delving into the multitude of strange occurrences that happen in Scotland and beyond. You can contact us with your own accounts at the Scottish Paranormal Podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on all podcasting sites, YouTube, Facebook and Instagram and you can contact us by either means. Tonight's episode we have Karen Newell on the show from Secret Acoustics. We'd just like to get right into it now and we we'll welcome Karen at the show. So we're just inviting uh, Karen uh, Newell into the show. Um, good to have you on, Karen. Uh, how are you today? It's, I reckon it's, it's daytime where you are and it's nighttime where I am. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, afternoon here. Doing very well today. Thank you for inviting me, Chris. Ah, you're more than welcome to come on. Yeah, uh, thanks for coming on. Um, it looks like there's maybe nice weather behind you. Is it nice and sunny where you are? It is not. We have no. rain today, <laughs> but it, it's bright. That's what you're seeing through a skylight. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, well, in Scotland, now the weather's been it's been not too bad over the last wee while um, for being Scotland. Um, so, well, for the good summer so far, it's, uh, it's starting to get a bit windy now and again, but we'll see how it goes. We're hoping for the rest of it to be um, a bit better. It's the only kind of positive side of kind of climate change in this kind of point, but um, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I grew up in Oregon, which I've always been told is similar to the Scotland climate. But now they're so dry there. They're not getting nearly as much rain as when I was a child. So, yeah. Yeah. Good to pay attention. It's, it's kind of like here. We, we're we starting to get, um, although it, it fluctuates through the years, like going back in the day, I could remember when I was younger, having long, hot summers. But, um, you know, when you're younger, your memory just probably sticks in some of the good points and it kind of seems longer um but i mean sometimes it's been pretty wet summers pretty wet quite right through winters are a bit hit or a miss but it's funny because sometimes you get a winter which could be three feet of snow out there and then you get some winters like last year which was three inches snow for a few weeks and that was it not a lot yeah. Um, so it changes and it's, it's funny you know what I mean but the summers can be a bit hit or miss as well so we got over here it could be as I said the now it's been pretty warm um, it's actually it was warmer here than it was over in like in continental like Spain and things like that so um, I don't know what it is like now but I'm hoping I go on holiday um, next Friday so I'm hoping for the weather <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right so listen thanks for coming on as I said um I just basically wanted to get invite you on. Um, if you want to, um, I'll do an intro first, as I said, but I'd like to, if you want to get introduce yourself and can you go through there, mainly about sacred acoustics. Uh, that's kind of what um, what I know you from. Um, but if you want to kind of describe a bit more about it and then go through there, we'll, we'll kind of get into it. So just introduce myself, you want? Yes, yes, just kind Hello. of. Hello, okay. Hello. Hello, waiting for that screen. Okay, hello, I'm Karen Newell, and I am co-founder of Sacred Acoustics, a company that creates binaural beat audio recordings, and I help people get into expanded states of awareness using these recordings and other methods. So I can I can came across yourself um, through another podcast. I think you were talking to Grant Cameron. Um, Grant Cameron um, on his podcast, I think it was, we are talking about uh, Sacred Acoustics. That's where I kind of picked it up um, from there. Um, I have got it and I do use it um, as well. I've got one of the kind of the beginner ones to start off with, but mainly how did how did you kind of come from, I reckon before you worked in um, the news, newspaper industry and magazine industry, how did you go yes. from, how did you go from that to an a sacred acoustics and obviously like mind development and, and things like that so how did the journey go for you transition from that to that yeah it was an interesting transition i spent 25 years in the media industry i had a communications major in college and i was very interested in mass media 
And so that's what I did for 25 years. And I ended up learning a lot of skills with technology, with web development and uh, all kinds of useful things that have helped me out with creating sacred acoustics. But when I first met, uh, actually it was my own personal explorations of uh, trying to find a way to meditate. I had learned how important meditation was. And so in my spare time from my job, I was trying to learn how to do these kinds of things. And it was very challenging. I couldn't meditate. I would sit quietly and watch my breath as many uh, professionals recommended. And all that would happen for me is uh, my racing thoughts, my planning for all of the projects I was managing and such would go through my mind. And I didn't think there was anything uh, relaxing about it at all. And so I persisted. I persisted because I had always had these curiosities of big questions that many of us have, you know, why am I here? What is my purpose? And wanting to find that information by going within was my goal. And so I kept learning other techniques and it was eventually I discovered sound was a very useful way at helping to calm the mind from those distracting thoughts. Mm -hmm. And the kinds of sounds I would listen to at first were gongs or tuning forks, brass bowls, crystal bowls, and those kinds of instruments emit a very nice kind of in, uh, entrancing kind of sound. And yeah. it was uh, binaural beats, audio recordings that I finally discovered made all the difference in the world. And I learned through analyzing the sound in crystal bowls, brass bowls, and so on, mm -hmm. that they're actually uh, emitting natural binaural beats, although with a lot more higher overtones involved that make them so beautiful. But those are binaural beats being directed to us. And the reason why they worked for me is because they quiet the mind from that busy beta state. That's the, the beta state is when we're walking around, we're talking, that's what most adults are in most of their waking consciousness hours. Mm -hmm. And just below that is alpha. That's uh, where we kind of get into a focused state. Below that is theta. Theta is even more focused, more like a trance state or maybe if you're in the, the flow or the zone, as they say. Yeah. Delta is the state we're in when we're asleep. So it's between awake and asleep where the sweet spot lies. So often feeding theta signals to the brain will help to quiet those distracting thoughts. And that's how it worked for me. And so while I was out there going to workshops and learning more about this sound, I met Kevin Cossey. He's the co-founder of Sacred Acoustics. Mm -hmm. And he was a, a, is still a mechanical and electrical engineer. And engineers like to take things apart and put them back together in new yeah. and innovative ways. And that's what he wanted to do with binaural beats. And so when he found out I had this vast library of different binaural beat recordings, we entered into a collaboration. He was in New York City at the time. I was in Baltimore, Maryland. And so that's many hours apart uh, by driving or train. But yeah. we just used technology. So we would share a Skype screen. This was before Zoom became so popular. Mm -hmm. And we would analyze what was in these different recordings. And it was Kevin who developed these innovative ways to recreate binaural beats that uh, it was really based on our personal kind of interest. The, the types of tones that helped us were the tones that we developed. And it was about a year into this effort that we met Dr. Eben Alexander. And uh, he wrote that book, Proof of Heaven, a neurosurgeon who had a near-death experience. He hadn't written the book yet when we met him. I didn't know his story, yeah. but uh, he was very interested in binaural beats. And uh, when uh, he was up in New York looking for publishers uh, for his book, he met with Kevin and listened. He was the first person besides Kevin and myself who listened to these recordings and he was blown away. And he was the one who catalyzed us to create these recordings and make them available for others. So that is why now there is a company called Sacred Acoustics that creates these types of recordings that at first were created just for our own personal exploration, yeah. but many, many hundreds, thousands of others have found them very useful for addressing all kinds of personal goals. It's great. I mean, it's, going, going back to when you were doing the initial research and looking at like gongs and crystal bowls and, and things like that, did you ever come across um, 
them getting used in a in a way where they would have been listened to on either side of the brain, or would it, or was it just mainly they were just getting listened to in a in a kind of sense where they were making the sound from it? Because I always kind of think with the binaural beats and obviously because you've got one kind of sound going into it's, it's two two different kind of tones going in, and then it's kind of bringing it together and your your head is kind of getting that right with saying that. Um, so I always kind of wondered about in a natural sense where things like that gongs, crystals. You you would certainly get it with maybe like a, in a tribal setting with drums and stuff like that gone off it would happen. But did you ever find anything off that? But it would maybe happen with the gongs or things like that. But they would do it in either side to try and create that state. Well, it's not that people were. Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. But the research that we discovered is that uh, the bowls and such that I mentioned are emitting these naturally, and I believe it's just because of the. Uh, sound vibration bouncing off you know the two walls of the, ah, right okay yeah of the bowl and with the gong we found if actually we have used uh, the gong sound but in a completely different way in some of our recordings and what we've done is we've placed like a metal ball on the gong and then had it move around the gong and recorded that sound and so there's many different ways to use instruments to create these kind of sounds but interestingly down in peru once Kevin was down in Peru and he was participating in a shamanic ceremony mm -hmm. and there was one shaman on one side of this group of people and a second shaman on the other side and they were both blowing into a conch shell and Kevin was recording this uh, and later he when he analyzed it these two shamans were playing binaural beats they were each playing a different frequency as mm -hmm. you said binaural beats are when one frequency is in one ear a slightly different frequency in the other ear. Yeah. And what our brain hears is this wah, wah, wah sound. And uh, that's the that's the in brain's interpretation of mm -hmm. that sound. But we've also found uh, in Australia, in our travels in Australia, people use the didgeridoo also to create binaural beats. And some very talented players can create a binaural beat just with their one didgeridoo, the way they blow into it. But sometimes it takes two, you know, one on either side to create them. So musicians for millennia have been uh, creating these unusual sounds to help people get into these expanded states of awareness. There's even ancient chambers. I love that you're in Scotland, or I guess it's Ireland that has Newgrange. Yeah. But also, yeah, there's also in uh, the uh, Malta, the hypogeum chamber in Malta. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's been studied as well as Newgrange and many other man-made sites that seem to emanate or resonate with a frequency that is right around where a male voice might be making that om sound. So I can only imagine that these chambers were created for that purpose using the human voice and potentially other instruments to create that reverberation right there in the chamber and help people get into these states. I think I heard in the past as well, I might be wrong with this, um, um, but some of the chambers, they they actually drew or carved some of the pictorial kind of sounds that the sound would make, if it was maybe vibrating or they maybe make circles and, and things like that. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, I think you're talking about cymatics, and that's where you can take... Um, a substance, say sand or sugar, and you can place it on a, like a pizza pie plate, a big circle of, yeah. of metal. You put that substance there, place that uh, round or whatever shape uh, piece of material onto a speaker and play one frequency right into it. And yes, it will form different shapes. And I've been very fascinated with cymatics because when you analyze music, any type of sound, the um, spectral analysis and other such tools give you visual represent representations of what those sounds look like. And but what we did find is that the sound, uh, the sound, if it's consistent going into these materials, uh, will not always produce the same shape. It depends on the actual material and the. Uh, plate that it's lying on, sometimes it won't be exactly the same. So we have to be careful with interpreting that a sound will always uh, create the same shape in every substance that it's affecting. But mm -hmm. 
But speaking of the spectral analysis and other visual ways of looking at the recordings, our binaural beats, because we include monaural beats in a very specific way that Kevin designed, ours actually look like uh, D the DNA helix. And that's why we came up with that name, neural helix, because our binaural beats created with monaural beats create that shape, uh, which is so very fascinating. But lots and lots of shapes can be created by sound. And it just shows how vibration has an influence on physical matter. And so it's an incredibly interesting thing to study. As I take it, you're aware of like the, the Rosalind Chapel, the, the cubes in Rosalind Chapel with the, uh, apparently obviously making the shapes, but as you say, it, it could be interpreted slightly different with the different material that might be used as well. But it's, it's interesting when you see that because uh, I was actually at Ros Rosalind quite recently. I've been there a good number of times, but it's when you see it, when you see that it's like a, angel or a cherub or something with a flute and there's they're all definitely playing different parts of music and then you've got the cubes that are highlighted right throughout the ceiling in, in these sections so it's quite well, an interesting. I've actually been to Roslyn Chapel. Evan Alexander and I visited Roslyn Chapel and I agree absolutely fascinating wondering what was the purpose of all of these symbols and uh, we try to you know, figure it out from this end. But I imagine that they were very specifically and intentionally placed for uh, reasons we can only speculate, but fascinating. I'm sure somebody's recreated the the, well, the music from it, or not the music, but the tones from it. I'm ah, sure been, yes, yes. I'm sure it's been it, recreated, but um, it was mainly on, I think they were using maybe like a copper plate and like a violin type thing or something like that to try and recreate it. Uh, right. It reminds me of the solfeggio frequencies, which are also found in uh, ancient times. And uh, those are very interesting to work with. And uh, we've created one recording, it's called Light Body, that incorporates all the solfeggio frequencies. So yeah, anytime ancient knowledge uh, can be sort of resurrected into modern times, I find it very useful, mm -hmm. especially when uh, getting into expanded states, because I feel as though you know, I was always been fascinated by uh, mystery schools. The Greeks, the Egyptians, and all kinds of cultures had their own mystery schools. Yeah. And I believe that they taught people methods for getting into these expanded states. So they would know firsthand that they were more than just a physical body. And that's what near-death experiences and all kinds of things show us. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think a modern day mystery school might be uh, very useful for many people. That's what I thought of it as when I was going through all of my own training, taking different courses and such, mm -hmm. is that these are the mysteries that uh, humans have been discovering for millennia and all of us can take advantage of them in useful ways. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, I do find it really interesting and it does link back to quite a lot of things like the mystery schools and things like that as well, because... Um, um, I think is it is one of the there's, there's kind of a theory is where the actual one of the um is that a sarcophagus that's not really a sarcophagus but it's supposed to be some to actually um form a trance or something like that with the same type of thing um in one of the pyramids. I mean, but that's just it's one of the theories going kind to of attach there. Um in regards to when you were doing a lot of your research about ancient sites, what other kind of ancient sites um came came through your research that you were really showed all your interest in. Was there other kind of sites like standing stones or you try anything with things like that or well um uh, I'm interested I'm fascinated by all sacred sites and uh Kevin actually visited Newgrange and he actually created a recording specifically for Newgrange and he couldn't uh, manage to get into the chamber and listen to his recording because they keep the tourists uh, to a minimum, but he was able to park some distance out from the Newgrange site and listen to the recording. And he felt like he connected with a shaman from that time mm -hmm. and saw him dancing and, and performing rituals. So Newgrange has fascinated us for that reason, but I've always been fascinated by the great pyramids in Egypt. And how interesting that the uh, the biggest of those has uh, the king's chamber. And yeah. they found, yeah, that it emits something like an eight hertz tone or something. And eight hertz is right there, theta alpha, you know, one of the uh, tones, one of the brainwave states that is indicative of being in an expanded state. 
But I love how they've used that chamber. Even now, I've, I've heard stories. I've not visited, unfortunately, but I've heard stories of people who go in there, lie in the sarcophagus uh, yeah. the, in the king's chamber, and they have these amazing experiences and visions. And I feel like that's just the resonance of all the rituals that potentially have taken place inside of that pyramid. And what fascinates me so much about the pyramids and other sacred sites is that many of them have been built with uh, technology that we don't have today, that we can't duplicate. Engineers will say we couldn't duplicate what they did. And one of the ways, one of the theories of how the Great Pyramid was built was using sound, <laughs> using sound to uh, make the stones less dense and then able to move them into position. Maybe they're somewhat liquefied from the vibrational sound and then yeah. put into position. So I imagine there was all kinds of more natural types of technology that helped us do things that today we only think we can do with you know tools and instruments. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that the human body and voice has much more ability than we can imagine today. Yeah, there's so many secret sites where Archaeology just uh, it doesn't add up, <laughs> so far too many. Um, yeah. So in in regards to when you were doing going back and you were doing a lot of your own training, um, what what can you when you were doing like for example like binaural beats and that and what kind of places did you go? To? Was it things like the Renault Institute or was it other places um, within America where you were, or was it different places throughout the world where you were looking at all the different aspects? Uh, consciousness? Well, when Kevin and I were first experimenting, we were very interested in sacred sites. And so sometimes we would, in our uh, inner journeys, we would have an intention, say, to go visit the Great Pyramid. And also Kevin had a particular fascination with other planets. And so some of our journeys, we uh, would travel to other planets. And we actually, this might say, sound crazy to some of your listeners, but for us, it was just uh, mental constructs that we were building in order to have a shared experience. And so we mentally constructed a spaceship that we could travel in uh, throughout the universe. And uh, what was so interesting is that Kevin was and still is quite adept at out of body experiences. And so I always was a bit intimidated when he would explain what was going on in, in his experience. What we would do is we would listen to the recordings at the same time, yeah. uh, the ones that we were experimenting with. And then we would call each other and tell each other what we experienced. And sometimes we would find our experiences crossed over and so in those discussions, he would explain he was out of his body. And at first I thought, well, I don't have that sense. I feel like my awareness is traveling, but I'm not necessarily bringing my etheric body with me. Yeah. And so as we compared experiences, we found that it's really not necessary to have an etheric body with you to really encounter the same types of energies, because I found I could describe the same types of things that he was encountering just from a little bit different perspective. And so we had all kinds of adventures like this. Kevin would often uh, find himself encountering alien beings and, and such. And I would find myself encountering loving energies. And uh, he seemed more interested in uh, co finding conflict where I was more interested in finding harmony. And so I found it very interesting that we were able to have these journeys together and yet still I think we were teaching each other these different aspects of how to have these experiences. And uh, one thing that I found when I first started uh, really going deep into these meditative states is that I would get very emotional. And I learned from other teachers that uh, these emotions were just stored in my system waiting to be noticed. And yeah. so as I noticed them, it was a bit disturbing, but what I learned was I just really needed to allow them to be expressed and then be released. And that allowed me to have uh, deeper, more profound experiences as that allowed me to touch more of that soul aspect that we all have. Mm -hmm. Most of us aren't aware of it, but when we get quiet inside and uh, we start to notice our thoughts, mm -hmm. it's that part of us that's noticing the thoughts that is most interesting. And when you develop that perspective, 
that's where you can really gain a, a much greater understanding maybe of why we are here and what is our purpose. My original curious questions for this journey. So uh, yeah, Kevin and I had all kinds of different experiences in different ways. It was a wonderful learning experience. And when we met up with Evan, he joined us. We started to have these three-way uh, inner journeys uh, from three different locations and at the same time. Yeah. And, and Eben offered yet another way of experiencing these types of things. I can recall one journey where the three of us, uh, we went to Arcturus, the star Arcturus. And each of us, when we came back and told our story, described encountering three beings who then each one of them took each of us to show us around our tourists. You know, were we making this up? Was it, you know, I don't know, but it was fascinating to go into my inner world and then find that other people, when they were doing it at the same time, had similar experiences. And when this starts to happen to you over and over again, you start to realize yeah. there's so much more to our world than just the physical. And that's why those sacred sites are so fascinating because I think this is knowledge that we used to have as humans. And somehow through materialist science, thinking that only the physical world is real yeah. and any of these human experiences I've been talking about are just delusions. Uh, you know, That's what our current Western society is embedded in, this idea that only physical reality is real. And yet when you start to have these experiences, you come to know, not just believe, but know, no, there is much more to our world than the physical. Yeah, totally. I think we've went too far one way and then we've kind of lost what we should have had. But do you think we'll go back that way? Do you think the humanity is going back that way in regards to learning more about what else is there apart from here, materialistic world? Well, everything we know about time and human experience is that it happens in cycles. And uh, so I have no doubt that we're headed back towards the uh, more spiritual understanding of our human existence. And it's the uh, Eastern tradition. There's something called the yugas. And those are very grand cycles of time. Every 26,000 years, there's different interpretations of the cycle. But one interpretation of the cycle is that we're coming out of the bottom of that materialist kind of uh, thinking. And if you look at our, you know, the, the arc of human civilization, the dark ages represent the bo most bottom of that yuga cycle. And the top of that, where we're now headed, is what some uh, back in Greek and other times might have referred to as the golden age. You know, we hear about this through different uh, spiritual scriptures, through ancient traditions, talk about this golden age where humans had much more ability. So yes, I think we are working our way back to it. And according to the yuga uh, theories, this is our most dangerous time because we're starting to become more open to this spiritual knowledge, like more and more people are having out-of-body experiences, uh, communication with people who have already died and such. Uh, yeah. This is happening more and more often, but we don't have the, the correct knowledge. We're still, generally speaking, mired in only the physical world is real, at least our scientists and you know engineers who are creating technology they uh, aren't necessarily tapped into the spiritual aspect of existence so as more and more of us become more spiritual i think we'll catch up with ourselves but according to the yuga cycles this particular time is the most critical time mm -hmm. and in the past has been when civilizations end up not surviving yeah. and so when we hear about that this is that time where yeah, we hopefully will make it through this time. According to any, you know, prophets are always making comments about this sort of thing. And uh, according to the positive types of prophets that I've been hearing from, that this time we will make it through that cycle and have an exponential uh, spiritual growth as a result. So we'll see, right? We we can't know for certain. Think, fingers crossed. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing. I mean, you hear you hear that for, from so many different areas of consciousness, and for, and people looking into consciousness. So about the time where it's it could be either there's some saying it could be negative, some say it could be positive, some say it's fifty fifty, as in where we're at a time where it's a, a choice 
type thing. Um, but they, just... they often say that it's up to us. Yeah. And, but most of us aren't aware that it's our choice. And so it's very interesting because uh, it brings up that concept of as above, so below, or as without, so within. The yeah. idea that our inner world uh, or that the outer world is a reflection of our inner world. And so the more of us who kind of pay attention to that inner world, clear out, you know, any traumas that aren't serving us, develop more compassion for our fellow humans and the understanding that we are we will not die when the physical body ends. Our awareness continues. And so why not have that awareness now and realize the big picture? I think that will help us get through the the transition that so many have predicted. When when you're going back to when you're having out of body experiences, were you using the sacred acoustics for that or were you using a different method to do that? I used both. And uh, the the thing about an out-of-body experience is that you really want your body to be profoundly relaxed, but your mind is not quite asleep. And so some of my out-of-body experiences have happened during that space as I'm just waking up in the morning. Yeah. And uh, it can happen as well, just as you're falling asleep at night, uh, or it could be during a nap. So you're where you're kind of uh, not fully asleep, but your body is asleep. And so when you're in that state, the uh, it's kind of a natural state to, uh, to use your mental intention to have an out-of-body experience. Binaural beats help you get into that hypnagogic state between awake and asleep. But once you're in that state, whether through natural means or with the help of binaural beats, I found that I needed to employ uh, mental techniques. And those techniques uh, were really just about imagining my energy body moving in different ways in and out of my body. So one of those visualizations I found so useful was at night I would lie there and imagine that my uh, energy was moving all the way out the top of my head, all the way as far as it could go to infinity. And then I would call it back and it would come back in through my head and then out my feet. And so I would just imagine this energy moving vertically in and out of my body. And another uh, way to do this is to imagine that your body is rolling, right? You, like spinning like a log. You could also imagine that you're walking upstairs or walking downstairs, going up an elevator, going down an elevator. So I think you get my drift. Yeah, yeah. The, I, yeah the idea is to think, to imagine that you're moving in all of these different ways while you're in that hypnagogic space. Mm -hmm. And it can be very frustrating because you, you have this great expectation, you know, waiting for something to happen. And yet, if you have too much expectation, you kind of spoil the natural uh, kind of movement into that state. I know the the one very uh, profound experience for me, I, I had just read a book by, or I hadn't even read the book. The book had arrived in the mail from uh, William Boldman. He's one of the very excellent teachers who teach out of body techniques. Mm -hmm. And uh, William Boldman's book, I had just barely glanced at, but it was on my mind. And I went to sleep that night and the next morning, I remember having that uh, classic uh, sound that many talk about of this rushing sound in my ears. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah. Loud. And then next thing I know, I'm, you know, I wasn't up on the ceiling looking down at my body as many people will describe. I was in a home three doors down from mine, standing on the porch, looking in the window. And uh, so that was rather interesting. And I actually uh, witnessed some things in that window that I was able to verify yeah. a couple of days later. So uh, out-of-body experience can happen in all kinds of ways spontaneously for some. I know some people, when they listen to our recordings, they'll naturally find themselves in that state. And then they wonder when they want it to happen, how can they make it happen? And it's very challenging. Some people find they, and this happened for me too, like, you know, you, you pop out in that moment and then you're so excited about it. It's over before it even begins. So yeah. really it's a process of trial and error, you know, and repeat, repeat, repeat until you're successful. And I don't do this all of the time. I spent a, a several years where I was very intent on these techniques and was able to create these experiences, but it's not like, uh, I'm driven to do this on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, 
But if I want to, I know that I would probably have to spend a few weeks again, sort of rebuilding my ability to do that. But all of us can do this with enough time and effort. What, what advice could you give, for example? Um, so if, if you're doing this at a, a night time between like the awake and sleep period, um, is it better to do it when you're near or quite tired or do it a good bit before that so you are got so you won't fall asleep for example straight away which the the kind of yeah, you, don't it... be too, you don't want to be too tired that's my, that's my problem that's, i'm asking for myself here <laughs> yeah, yeah you don't want to be too tired because uh your mind will want to stay alert and aware of what's going on and yeah. i know when i'm very very sleepy that's much more challenging to do i just need my sleep yeah and so just, you want to be well okay. rested but not to keyed up. Um, I know I'm very sensitive to caffeine, for example. So I would never uh, consume caffeine before trying to do something like this. But we're all different. So some may have that sensitivity and some may not. And there may be other sensitivities, you know, that I'm not aware of. Mm -hmm. I used to have, um, it may have been nothing at the time, but I used to have uh, sleep paralysis. Like I had it for about two years solid and it wouldn't stop. I mean, it was like every, it was about every other week. And um, and it it happened all the time. You know what I mean, and it, and it stopped. It all happened in two properties, and it stopped. Um, and it used to. And I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. At the time, I was eighteen, and it was the one time I bought my first book in, uh, on um, out of body experiences, and I was eighteen. And I think back then I was trying it. I was trying it, and um, thinking unsuccessful or, or whatever. But then uh, I could remember. The very, very first time I had the experience, I remember the first time I had the experience where um, I was sitting watching TV and I must have dozed off and I woke up and my, uh, I was kind of, I was in my body, but I could only see, you always feel like there's a presence there in the room. I don't know if it's a, a byproduct of just having that type of experience, but you always feel like there's somebody there. So I, I was kind of sitting in the chair. I could only maybe, I don't know if I could move my eyes, but I could look a wee bit to that side. And I kind of thought there was somebody there, but couldn't see anybody. And I eventually came out of it out of the experience of just having um, sleep paralysis. But from that moment, it happened. Um, it was in a certain property I stayed in, but it happened like about every week to two weeks, it would happen, right? And um, it only happened, it happened in another property. And the very, very last time it happened, I thought I'd seen somebody standing and then coming towards me and kneeling down. And that was the last one I had um, from it. And um, it always interested me. And I mean, I, there's a few kind of theories why I thought it happened. And then it wasn't until recently I remembered. And I was like, because I used to, the property was quite a, in a strange area. And um, it's up next day. Well, it's not too far away from uh, an ancient site up here. We've got an ancient site. It's like, it dates back to like five and a half thousand years. It's like an old kind of henge, but it was a wooden henge and there's burial mounds and stuff. And it was not too far away from that. And I used to kind of think it was linked in with that, that kind of area and stuff. And then, I maybe took that elsewhere, but it was funny because it was only recent that I remember there's like my very very first book I bought in sleep uh, or in, in out of body experiences was then, and that's the first time I tried that. So I don't know if maybe if something was happening where it was potentially trying to happen and I wasn't really experiencing it or remembering that or, or whatever else, but it always was it was quite a kind of funny one. Well, sleep paralysis is very related to out of body experience, mm. uh, and that is because. Some people maintain that every single night when we fall asleep, our energy body is off having spiritual connections and we just don't remember, but that's part of sleep is allowing our spirit to roam free. And so the body without that spirit in it is, uh, is paralyzed, right? It can't move. So sometimes when I was practicing out of body, and even if I wasn't practicing out of body techniques, uh, I would wake up and find that I couldn't move my body like that's sleep paralysis. So I thought that my full energy had not yet re-entered back into the body. So I think that's why it happens when you're doing out of body techniques uh, that you're almost there, <laughs> that you're you're you've succeeded in getting the body to be profoundly relaxed, but you haven't quite released your awareness or your awareness has returned before the body is fully enlivened by the entire aspect of your energy. But how interesting that you were close to a sacred site when you had that. So, uh, it it if, reminds me of Kevin's experience when he encountered the shaman in his meditative state outside of Newgrange. It was maybe about a mile away from it. 
Um, but the interesting thing was, I'm not going to go too much into it, listeners have heard the story before, but the interesting thing, one of the stories I had um, collected was about a kind of sighting up there of some type of creature, type etheric, type light creature kind of thing. Um, and it was called the Silver Man. That was the kind of story. And the interesting thing, going back in the day, I had a, a strange experience in the same area, but it was just like a, um, the Oz Factor type experience where... I had a, a funny feeling not to go any further into the woods. And so I cut my run short. I was at running and came back. So 20 years later, I interviewed the guy with the story. And it was in the same the same area. It was like it was like probably 50, 100 metres away from the same spot where I had that strange experience. I didn't see nothing, but it was one of the ones where the way I described it is like going back to being a child when you're afraid of something, you don't know what it is. And it was kind of like that. I was just out for a, a, a run during the day. But I got to this certain part of the woods and it was something kind of stopped me in my head anyway, and just like I, I couldn't go any further. I didn't want to go any further. I had a kind of theory of that. But there's burial mounds there. I never even knew there was burial mounds there um, at the time because it was like a, a, a bit is really unknown with those burial mounds, but there is burial mounds there. And the site next to it, the site's actually probably is about half a mile, if if as far as that, where actually the Henge bit was that dates back that, that, that time. But the interesting thing, when when I had um, spoke to the the guy about the story, um, I'd, he'd, he'd mentioned in it. He'd mentioned in it. He says, um, and I was the, from that area. I was from a different area. I was like a town, maybe about five miles away or something. And um, and I asked him about. He said, "Well, I think my this guy said the, the story. Some experience he started when I was younger." And I think it attributed to the certain area I stayed, and he stayed about a mile, a mile and a half away from the the place, right? So he was telling me some of the stories when he was younger about like staying in this this bit of town, and it was strange. And I, I kind of thought I was like, ah, right, and it, it clicked, it came to me, and I actually stayed in the same area, and it was like that's where the sleep paralysis happened, right? Yeah. Because I actually moved in with a friend for like about a year, right? And I was stay had a, a had a rented a room off him, so I was there. And that's where the, the first experience of that happened. And when I checked where he stays, it was like doors away. It was like it wasn't far away. It was like literally in the same bit. And I attribute to like being in a strange place, but at the same time, that is when uh, I tried sleep I tried um, astral traveling for the first time. Um and then I was unsuccessful and then I, I kinda left it for years and then kinda came back again and was looking more into it. But it was just an interesting bit of the area where I where I kinda stay. Um but enough about the, the stories here. So in in regards to um the workshops you do and stuff like that as well, what type of workshops do you do? Do you do them as well as like obviously the sacred acoustics? The is it workshops of people and things? Yeah, usually our workshops, I teach the workshops with Evan Alexander. He's the one when, uh, as I said, who catalyzed this idea that we would make them available to others. And so he was already, after his book came out, being asked to give talks and occasionally experiential workshops. So he's the one who said, Karen, you're coming with me. You're going to help teach how to do this. And at first I was a, a little, it wasn't my thing really to do any sort of public speaking at all. I was a technology person behind the scenes and it was a bit intimidating but uh, I've soon just learned how to share, you know, what's happened for me and uh, how other people can develop their own techniques. But usually we talk a lot about how science supports the reality, not only of an afterlife, but this idea that consciousness is fundamental. And I interpret that to mean that that means our souls are fundamental because that consciousness is our soul energy. Yeah. And uh, we're really a part of that consciousness. So we teach people how science supports all of these kinds of concepts that you and I have been discussing. And that it's not just an illusion of a you know crazy person, that these are real human experience. What's so interesting is what we find is that so many people have had these kinds of experiences, some that you've been describing and many, many others, but they don't like to talk about them because our society makes fun of them or doesn't believe them or you know, tells them they're crazy, whatever it is. I know in the UK, I hear so many stories of people after having these kinds of experiences get put into a mental hospital for treatment. And so uh, that doesn't happen as much here because we don't have as, as many mental hospitals these days, but uh, it does happen. 
where uh, people get confused and think that they're just having a psychotic episode. So we teach people these are not psychotic episodes, and there's actually big differences between uh, psychotic episodes and actual legitimate spiritual experience. And then we help people by uh, playing the audio recordings and help people get into that expanded state. So it's not just about learning the concepts, it's about experiencing it for yourself. And uh, everyone responds differently. Some people will say, oh, I fell asleep. Uh, others will have full blown encounters, you know, with their deceased grandparents or something. Uh, everyone is, uh, is unique. And it's that self discovery of how you respond that is really the journey. And so I know you've been using them, you probably are responding in, in uh, ways that other people have. And normally people will uh, first notice that their thoughts have lessened, that they're able to maintain uh, that meditative state more easily, that they aren't distracted by their thoughts. They'll feel their bodies get profoundly relaxed. Some people will feel their bodies moving, <clears throat> even though they're not moving. Yeah. And that's sort of the energy body kind of doing its thing. I think our energy body is moving around us uh, all the time. We just don't notice it. And yeah. so when we get into that quiet state, we start to notice those fluctuations. Some people will notice uh, moving from extreme cold to extreme hot. Uh, that's also normal. It's just a, a sign that your energy is shifting. Uh, people just have all kinds of different ways to experience. They'll like, see colors. Uh, beginners are especially amazed because they, uh, you know, get into states they, they don't recognize. And longtime meditators are sometimes amazed because they're able to get into deeper states more quickly. Yeah. And some longtime meditators actually find the sounds to be distracting from their normal routine of getting into these states. And so I always encourage people to combine techniques if yeah. they have, you know, pranayama breathing or other types of breathing that they've done, maybe a mudra, a mantra, you know, whatever technique you may have learned, try that to, or out of body techniques, try those techniques while you're listening to sacred acoustics recordings and see if your experience is different. And what I would recommend where people start is with the whole mind bundle. And that gives you a recording in in delta, in theta, and in alpha. So you can learn how you, your brain waves respond to those different states. And the reason we all respond differently is because our brains are so unique. And it was so fascinating when I learned that our brain waves, if you measure them on an EEG, are so unique that they can be used to identify people much the same way as fingerprints. Mm -hmm. So that explains why we all would uh, respond in different ways. And keep in mind that these re our early recordings were very much designed uh, for my particular preferences, which happened to include a lot of delta, uh, more delta than theta, because I found that I needed more delta to get into those deep states, but still maintain awareness. But some people listen to those same recordings and simply fall asleep. So again, now we have a, quite a variety of recordings that uh, people can find what works best for them. Yeah. Uh, the reason I fall asleep is because I'm doing it too late at night and I've been working all day. So I need to I need to kind of pull it back a bit earlier and do that. But in regards to other kind of meditation, um, like, is there any kind of set time? Is it just maybe do people do it throughout their day whenever they can do it? Or what would you yeah. most advise people to do it? Is it when it kind of suits them or what? Yeah, we have very few rules. It's really what works best for you. And as you say, Many people like to listen at night because they're falling asleep. They think it'll help them relax. And, and it does. Uh, and many people use our recordings to simply fall asleep. But if you want to have more vivid experiences, you want to make sure that you're not too tired, as we were saying before. And so that's why first thing in the morning is sometimes very useful. Sometimes people who have insomnia and wake up in the middle of the night, that's when they find is a wonderful time to do it. Others might set an alarm. Uh, I learned this technique in uh, out-of-body experience and lucid dreaming. If you set an alarm that kind of gently wakes you up in, in a deep period and then start doing a, a deep sleep period, uh, mm -hmm. then start doing these techniques or listening to the recordings, you might have an interesting experience. I know I've tried that as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember listening once to several hours 
of sacred acoustics one night uh, as because I couldn't sleep. And those several hours of listening in my inner world was, was actually about three days of a lucid dream that I just wasn't sure I was really going to wake up, up from. And uh, I knew that it was lucid. So I knew I was dreaming and I knew that time was distorted. But by the time I actually did wake up, it was just so shocking how uh, time was so dilated in yeah. that experience. Another common experience. People might seem like mine, it lasted forever. And in other situations, a long experience might seem like it only lasted, you know, a minute and a half or something. Yeah. So uh, lots and lots of, of ways. Uh, some people listen uh, as a nap. They'll listen in the middle of the day where yeah. they just want to take a little break. I know many people are telling me, uh, doctors, engineers uh, will listen in the middle of the day and this gives them their inspiration for the rest of their afternoon to write or to you know, come up with solutions to problems. And so they, these aren't just for having uh, you know, exotic spiritual experiences. Yeah. They can help people practically with studying, with sleep, with creative inspiration and so on. But what I really liked about it, um, but the ones I got, um, it was so easy to follow, really, really easy to follow. You just plug in, you know what I mean? And it didn't cost an arm and a leg as well. There's loads of kind of things out there, very expensive, but this wasn't. It was really, really, it was low cost, great. You know what I mean, it was like so easy to follow. I mean, it was like, I've got them on my phone and uh, right. and I'll, I'll just uh, either like plug in at night or sometimes if I, if I, um, I wake up during the night and say, maybe, you know, I had a, didn't have a great sleep. I was, and I can't get to sleep. I'll, I'll kind of plug in as well sometimes. Or if it is during the day, maybe I'm having a bit of stress, the stress to work, a bit of time out. You can just have it in the car. No, no when you're driving, obviously. Um, no, not when you're driving. You to bring that up. Now, yeah, I do know people, like including Kevin and some others, who do listen when they drive, but they're very long time listeners and they know how to keep themselves uh, focused on driving while they're listening. But Many others who aren't accustomed to these sounds, you may not realize you're in an altered state and then you're, you know, floating off the road. So you want to be very careful. The states can feel subtle, but they're very powerful. And I'm glad you mentioned that you listen using our app. That's for people who have iPhones and iPads. Mm -hmm. Any recordings you buy on our website, sacredacoustics.com, you can access within the app at no extra cost by signing in with your customer account. If you have an Android device, only in-app purchases are possible, but Androids have a much easier time accepting direct downloads and using other MP3 players to listen. Whereas uh, Apple devices, they don't play nice when it comes to other people's MP3 recordings. And so that's why we created the app because so many iPhone users wanted to listen conveniently. And so it's very easy to do now. So what's, what's next for yourself then? What you can, you've obviously, um, been working through this research and loads of material before this. Um, what's next for you moving on to? Well, we continue to create new sounds and innovative ways of uh, getting them to people. In fact, I was just in contact with Kevin this morning. His production cycle has slowed down, but we just invested in a, a brand new uh, keyboard so that he could create binaural beats in new ways. So that's what we're working on now. Uh, in terms of sacred acoustics. And Eben and I continue to create content to help people realize they're more than their physical bodies. Their awareness will continue beyond bodily death. And the research out there is only growing around that topic. And we both feel that as more and more people really know this knowledge to be true, that we'll start to see real change in our society to you know, really acknowledge the spiritual nature that we all have without necessarily religious beliefs, but that science can support a form of secular spirituality that we can all, you know, enter into very easily. And that's why I made those recordings uh, accessibly priced, because I don't want there to be a barrier for people to listen. And uh, that whole mind bundle that is the least expensive for beginners was used in a pilot study that showed a 26% reduction in anxiety after two weeks of listening. That's so it, that's why I made them uh, inexpensive because so many people are anxious and, and anyone who takes the time to reduce their anxiety, uh, first of all, that'll help you have more uh, the, of these kinds of spiritual encounters, but it also helps all of us 
The yeah. fewer people who are anxious in this world, the more of us who notice and uh, can, you know, really move forward with all of humanity's evolution. So, do you want to uh, do you want to tell everyone where they can find you? I know you just maybe said that a wee bit ago, but if you want to just plug your your website and stuff like that, where people can find you. Yeah, you can find uh, all about Sacred Acoustics at sacredacoustics.com and uh, look for the free download button and enter your email and we'll send you a free 20 minute ohm recording, which is what some people use for their daily practice without ever having to buy anything. And the contact form, if you have any questions at all, those come directly to me. And I answer most of those questions that aren't just standard technical support. And I even answer some of those. So yes, very easy to get in touch if you have any questions at all. Thanks very much uh, for coming on the show. And if you're back in Scotland again, give us a shout. Oh, I will. I love Scotland. <laughs> my, uh, I am. Uh, my ancestry is all from the UK, between right. Scotland on my dad's side and uh, England on my mom's side. So, all right. Okay. Yeah, I belong. You take, you take the Scottish side. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a blend. Us Americans, we're all blends. Yeah, yeah. we're the same. I mean, we're the same. Us Scots just like being Scottish, though. That's it. <laughs> it's been great to chat with you, and I'm so happy to have reached your part of the world. And thanks for all you do for getting these kinds of messages out there. Well, thanks for what you do. I mean, this is this is good to get this out for people and to make it a bit more accessible and understandable for people who get into meditation because it's the barrier of that sometimes can be people don't know where to start they don't know where to go i mean and this i mean it simplifies it down and it's, it's easy to access i mean so yeah i had a hard time at first because i thought i had to join some religious organization <laughs> or, you know commit to a lineage of sufi teachers just to get these techniques so it's really wonderful to be able to provide this type of thing without having to make such a commitment yeah yeah, totally. That's like so awesome. Thanks very much for your time. Yeah. All right. Thank you too.